a group of friends in Africa, and you can see how we have been very careful about the nature of our work. A group of friends, that's why we call ourselves a fund of friends. We started way back in 2011, and for those many years, our idea has been to reach out to you, the student leaders, um, wherever you are, with the idea that you will come to know that out of your journey as you grow as a leader, we know that you want to grow this journey of leadership. But we also know that you can't grow without something. And we realize that the best model or the best example out there we can follow to learn from our leaders and learn from our leaders is Jesus. And these principles and these leadership examples provide an opportunity, provides an inspiring message for us to emulate. And as we grow as leaders, we want to be seen as those that lead out of the example of Jesus. And it doesn't matter now, I will show you, I will say a few things later, that Jesus is a place where all of us can be connected. And I will expound that later. But part of it is in what? We should learn to live with each other, regardless of our color, regardless of our tribe, regardless of our nationality, regardless of where we come from. And that message of reconciling ourselves first to God, to those we live with, and to those we lead was part of his message. But also he, he, he desired, Jesus teaches us, that for us to lead, we need to go through some sort of personal transformation. Our integrity, our personal integrity should be an example that the, the people we lead can see. And these are issues very important to us as Africans. All of you know how we struggle with issues of alienation, discrimination, tribalism, wars, conflict. All of you know how we struggle with issues of character in leadership and, 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 and a lack of integrity in leadership. But Jesus' message was, it starts with us. And you have to start working on yourself. And once you work on yourself, you develop the assets, the skills, which help you to lead others. And that's what Jesus was teaching us. Again, as I said, the key motivation here, why Ewale? The key motivation for us was and continues to be, is it possible for us to transform the student leadership culture on university campuses? That is the big motivation. Now, what happens, all of you here know in that university is really, really where our leadership journey begins to come out, begins to flourish. We begin to see that we can lead out there. And if we can contribute towards shaping, reshaping the leadership culture of student leadership on university colleges, then we begin the journey of transforming the leadership of our countries, of our, our niche, of, of, of our continent, and even if you go back to our own lives and even our families. So really, this is the big motivation that OLF has, and it, it continues to be our motivation. When you go back to our days in the universities, many of us realized and found ourselves in a place where we are always at this loggerheads with our university administration, with the government and government agencies. If something happened, most of the time the students want to go on strike. And in our teachings in LLF, we teach this us versus, versus them ego, a collective ego of some sort, where we feel like we want to be our way of doing things is better than your way of doing things. We feel that if it is not us, then it is not you. So we, we have always been in a place in the university campuses and in our leadership fighting against one another because of tribe, because of different things. But even with our administration, our oh, administration does bad, all the students do bad. So that antagonism is something that OLF wants to address, that we, will, we feel like despite the fact that we are students and we are beginning to grow as leaders, we need to figure out ways in which we find places that help us to amicably find collaborative, synergetic ways in which we address this issue of fighting. You know it very well. Most of the time, students want to feel like if they don't demonstrate, they don't demonstrate some sort of violence, some sort of strike, some sort of going at loggerheads with the university campuses, then their issues won't be high. But LLF wants to change that through transforming the leadership culture on campuses into a culture of a place of learning to work with one another. And in, 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 and in this us versus them, 
at our level, we want to change it and say, no, we want to say that it's not just us versus them, but it's just about us working together, finding ways, channels in which we can be able to work together and, and find that. And Jesus is very strong on this. Everywhere you see in, in his message, he's teaching us to love ourselves and our neighbors, you know, to love our enemies, those we do not agree with. And this is not just in our campuses, but even in our communities. You know how we have been put in a place where tribalism, our tribe, our group, um, in one of our, in, in one of our, in many of, of the time we speak, we say, even we begin to fight alongside the clubs, Simba versus uh, Yanga, uh, Goma here versus uh, leopards and you find ourselves in a place where we are struggling even along lines of sport politics you know tribes but jesus was saying look here my message to you as leaders learn to love even your enemy you know pray for those who persecute you those who don't wish you well why we should we should think about doing good even to those that would not really be able to do good to them and jesus uses many examples and I'll go straight there and say, he asks us to recognize that we are all brothers and sisters and we have one father in heaven. And I want to say to you guys listening to me this morning that we are all brothers and sisters and daughters of Africa, by the way, and this beautiful earth, it's our place. If we, the leaders of the next generation can champion this message that we are all brothers and daughters of Africa and daughters of this beautiful earth, then we can find a place where we will champion the idea that we, the idea that we can coexist, we can do things together. And when this comes, we will break the barriers of tribalism, political affiliation, religious affiliation, and in the end, we'll be able to work for the good of the people we live and of Africa. Like a Dube in one of the songs I like so much that resonates with our, with our DNA, he talks about different colors, a one people. And for me, that song, every time I listen to it, it's really the heartbeat that also symbolizes this DNA, this idea that AYLF is trying to champion. The idea that there's no them. It's about just us, all of us together, working together to become them. In order for us to transcend this idea of those people versus against us, we need to work together to avoid that collective ego that makes us feel our group is better than the other group. And that can only come from, as a leader, you grow to develop wisdom. And you view life from a spiritual point of view, like Jesus has taught, where you see people as brothers and sisters, where you see and you love your enemy regardless of that. I want to share with you an example quickly there. My grandfather taught me things very much back, which I now see that they're very important. He had cows. And sometimes these cows would break the pen and go to the neighbors and they would eat up the crops there. What happened was that the neighbors would really be furious. Sometimes they would even have machetes and cut some of the cows. But guess what? My grandfather, every time cows gave birth and there was milk, the first milk went to the neighbor. And I never saw my grandfather fighting with the neighbor at all. When I think about it today, I see this wisdom we had, that you should even love your neighbor, you should care for them, because at the end of the day, you want to live, uh, you want to, to have a, co a, a peaceful coexistence. The other idea you should think about is humility. It doesn't matter whether whichever whether tribe you are born from, it doesn't matter which country, it doesn't matter which political party, which religious background you have. You should be able to recognize that you didn't make a choice to be where you are. By the grace of God, you are where you are. You are born in a different place, with a different color, different religion, different background. And because of that, it is an opportunity for you to be able to, to know that, yes, it's not just about me, but it's about us, all of us. The other idea is love. At OLF, we teach that if we develop compassion for one another, those who are less fortunate, those we lead, so that we don't see ourselves as different from them, then we have an opportunity to be leaders to those people. The other idea with OLF is exposure and understanding. When in the past, around this time, we've been in Nairobi, having traveled from Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, South Sudan, Uganda, to just be together as a family of friends, getting to know each other, getting to make friends with people who would otherwise not have made friends with. 
in a way, we are able to realize that really we are just the same people. It's just because I live up to the other border, I just because I belong to that religion or that group, or, but we are just the same people. So when you travel and you see other people, you develop some knowledge and degree of understanding, which helps you to realize that you, you are not better than the other people. So going along this line, in AYLF, we believe that if we are able to embrace such ideas, we grow, we mature, and as leaders, we begin to realize a new way of thinking for leaders, student leaders who can work and unite people, despite of the divisions that exist for them. Student leaders who believe that it is, a, it is not good for you to involve, be involved in some sort of corruption, some sort of uh, uh, way of, uh, of, of taking advantage of other people. We believe that the young women and the men in this forum and in our small groups can develop virtues, can develop a, a, some level of integrity and be the light and the salt wherever they are in the system. And even as where they grow, they become, you take up leadership in different roles in your career, you are able to realize that. The other point is, I want to mention here is that for us to develop that ability and grow, we need to see ourselves develop a culture of cooperation, a culture of synergy, a culture of moving away from conflict, being at loggerheads, pitting ourselves against leaders, and instead find a way in which we work to find a place of where all of us win, synergize, collaborate, interdependent on each other. And that is intertwined in our material that we like to share through the seven habits of early effects people by Steve Covey. And we like to champion this idea that as leaders as we grow, can we find levels of collaboration and working together? The other idea that you will take away from this forum today, I am hoping that as you grow, you will be able to know that what LLF wishes for you is to internalize these ideas we are putting before you this morning and the rest of the next coming hours, that you gain an inspiration. You will be transformed. And through our leadership programs we have, you're enjoying in your small groups and in the conference and the seminars in your campuses, in your country, you will have that opportunity for you to see this coming through. Stay connected to like-minded people, peers, make friends, develop partnerships, even not just in your own country, but even across the borders so that you can grow as a leader. Renew yourselves through meeting regularly in your small groups on a forum like this, in other different workshops and seminars we'll have. And let's encourage each other as we grow uh, as leaders in this journey so that we can realize our highest and best potentials so that we don't get compromised. That's why OLF calls it a family of friends. You are welcome to stay. If you want to not be compromised in your journey of life as a leader as you grow, we encourage you to stay in a small group, stay connected to the people and the members around this vision and you'll be able to realize your best and highest potentials. Aliyah Neb and Shabai uh, mentioned about the prayer breakfast. LLF just doesn't hang in the air alone. No, we are connected to the family of friends that is a worldwide network uh, around the prayer breakfast movement. This is, 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 is a journey that we have been part of as LLF, and the journey of the prayer breakfast movement starts in the US. I know Tim is here. I hope you'll get a time to talk about it. But it starts way back in the US in the 60s. And we see LLF as a junior wing of the senior leaders who come together to champion the same ideas I've been talking about earlier. So in the process, we as LLF emulate these leaders and say, these are people we can emulate. And if leaders can abandon their differences, their political differences, their tribal differences, come together and realize that God gives leadership, and, and, and embrace Jesus as their guide, we as AYLF also see ourselves as part of that process. We like to say at AYLF, we are, less, we are less of an organization. We want to be a movement. And I cannot testify to this. There are small groups of AYLF in places even where regional country coordinators have never been to. Reason is that once you, after this session, you grab the vision, you go with it. and. Be a leader of LLF in your, in, your, in your region, in your country, wherever you can be, so that, you can, so that we can continue to spread this message everywhere. So we are so many small groups 
right now as I speak, this number was for Tanzania, but as right now as I speak, there are over 150 small groups of AYLF all over this region. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alan 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 remember anything i hope you remember that here at ay life we are a family of friends and we are about three main things that is jesus friendship and leadership now of course remember that we're going to be having giveaways but before that because of time i'd like to introduce our next speaker that is uncle team uncle team i don't know if you can hear us wherever it is you're from um so with an MBA in Economic Development, Tim Kruter is the co-founder, director at Cornerstone Development Uganda. Uncle Tim is also co-founder and patron of AYLF. Uncle Tim is married, he has two adult children and two grandchildren. So Uncle Tim is going to be our next speaker. Uncle Tim, if you can hear me, I'd like you to say hi. Is it chilly where you are right now? How are you feeling? Uncle Tim. To you, discuss some of it. All right. Um, as, as we wait for Uncle Tim, you know, yeah. uh, Alan mentioned about the, the prayer breakfast. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's your experience with the NPB, National Prayer Breakfast, and have you uh, gotten a chance to even go for another, you know, a prayer breakfast in another country? So what, what's your experience? Maybe you can just share with me. Mm. Um, your first ever experience, how was it? So my first ever experience, I didn't know what I was, I, did, I didn't know what to look forward to because mm -hmm. of course it was the first time I was going for the NPB and it was at Safari Park. Yeah. And I remember I was dressed up in some makeup, makeshift yeah. suit because mm -hmm. it wasn't really a suit because I was expecting I'd find mm -hmm. people in, you know, official wear and everything. Mm -hmm. But really it was great to meet different people from mm -hmm. all around, I believe the world, mm -hmm. who had just come together for this main purpose of just praying for the country mm. so it was really humbling because even being there i mean not everyone really gets such an opportunity mm -hmm. so it was a very humbling experience i haven't i don't know i have been able yes i've gotten an opportunity to go to uganda for mm. their national prayer breakfast mm -hmm. and equally of course i think it was also a very different experience i couldn't compare to the one here in kenya but all all in all it was amazing all right. So once again, uh, welcome Karibu Sana. Mm -hmm. This is the May Gathering brought to you by Africa Youth yes, Leadership yes, Forum. Yes. My name is MC Neb. And I am Sharon Chabaiba. Remember, we're encouraging you to engage with us on the chat box. We'll do our very best to read and get back to you. But of course, right now we are waiting for Uncle Tim. And Uncle Tim, if you can hear me, I'd like you to say hi so that we can confirm that you're here with us. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm here and uh, I'm ready to go. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Up near the Ruanzori Mountains, uh, the border. Uganda and Kenya, um, and uh, just uh, missing being physically with our friends in Kenya this uh, time around, but uh, we'll do the best we can with what we're able to do with the technology. Um, I'm going to share a, a, a PowerPoint presentation, so I'll just go straight to that. And uh, I was asked to speak on this idea of the leadership crisis and the uh, COVID situation. So I've decided to call my talk, the crisis of leadership and leadership in the midst of crisis. And I'm aware that uh, time is short, so um, I'll skip a few sections, but if you would like to get this uh, presentation, you can send me an email, um, just my name and then uh, at Gmail, and I'll be happy to send it to you. But you send me an email, and then I'll send it, it uh, to you. So this is my whole family. Uh, half of us are in Africa, and half are in the US. And uh, 
yeah, it's just uh, something that I've done all my life is to grow up between these two worlds of the US and Africa, but most of my time has been in Africa. I went to high school in Kenya. So uh, Kenya is very much uh, part of my experience in this region. Um, in whatever capacity you are in as a leader, sooner crisis and how you perform during that time uh, will expose the quality and capacity of your leadership uh, ability. So the true test of leadership is really how well you can function during a time of crisis. And in this regard, the COVID-19 uh, situation has provided probably one of the greatest uh, tests in the last 100 years or so for the political leaders, the business leaders, and other leaders. And generally, the, the Wanainchi, the, the people have not really been with the way their leaders handled it. Uh, there was a large research project globally that found that 71% uh, of people around the world uh, say that this is the lowest point in their country's history. 63% said their leaders are out of touch with the rest of the country. And 62% said the people running this country don't really care what happens to me. In the US, for example, only 29% of the respondents uh, supported the country's leadership response to COVID. And that probably cost uh, President Trump's uh, election. Uh, that uh, survey was done in September. The election was in November. And uh, we all know what happened. but. Uh, his failure to rise to the moment and his leadership uh, ended up costing him um, politically. So this is just uh, something that we have seen. And yeah, it's easy for us to cr criticize our current leaders. But all of you uh, good people listening, um, as emerging leaders, sooner or later, you're going to face uh, a make or break kind of challenge to your leadership. So. Uh, today, I just wanted to give you a few tips on how you can handle uh, a crisis, uh, some practical ideas, and then also just on a, on a personal level, uh, the things you can do to keep yourself strong. There's a lot of talk today about the leadership crisis. Uh, the quality of the we are getting are not really seem to be our best and brightest. And it's surprising that a time when leaders talk and studied more than ever that we are still electing people based on uh, considerations that really have nothing to do with good leadership qualities. Uh, criteria like someone's appearance or the amount of money they have or their ethnicity, you know. And they think that there is a shortage of good Recording in progress. Okay, so, um, yeah, perhaps this statement summarizes the whole topic that the greatest crisis in the world today is a crisis of leadership. And the greatest crisis of leadership is a crisis of character. And it's really hard to know uh, how this character can be given to people. Um, it's clear that it's the courage to act uh, based on good values and principles. And it often comes from someone having strong convictions that are rooted in their character. 
And I think our parents and our mentors and our teachers are largely responsible for getting good character embedded into us when we're young. And this is why at AYLF, we're, we're dedicated to teaching and inculcating good values, principles, and character into young leaders. As the scriptures say, train up a child in the way they should go, and they will not depart from it. And in a similar vein as the African proverb, if you want to straighten a tree, you must do it when it is young. But at the end of the day, uh, for you and me, it's about uh, choosing to live by our best uh, principles and values. So um, yeah, that's really what I wanted to say about uh, character. And there's a way that the COVID crisis has really um, exposed this weakness of character that we see in many of our leaders in Africa today and in, around the world, really, uh, whereby you know some of the funds that were meant to help the common people cope with the crisis uh, were hijacked by those in key places for their personal gain. And it just seems like any time now that government funds are being released to solve a problem, corruption is uh, sure to follow around them. And uh, in our analysis, there's two big major issues in the world, in our region in particular, aspect of division that Alan talked about. And that's due to uh, lack of cohesion, failure to see everyone as a fellow brother and a sister. And the second one is corruption, the personal misuse of resources meant for the whole nation. And this is really due to a lack of character. So these two things have been uh, a, uh, a kind of a ongoing theme for us in the region, but just really for the whole world and uh, as a whole. So yeah, I, I wanna give you now like just a few tips that when you meet a crisis as a leader, how you can uh, approach it and then just uh, conclude with some personal thoughts on how to keep yourself strong. So a crisis uh, is an unexpected sudden disaster or a catastrophe that comes that impacts uh, people's lives at a very deep level that disrupts their normal routine. So here are six uh, steps as a leader when you're faced with a crisis. Uh, the first one is be visible and present. You see this a lot in um, the leader, like when there's an earthquake or a natural disaster somewhere, they go straight to the spot and they're around and, and the faster the leader is visible during times, uh, then they, they seem to get a lot of credibility and people look to them for comfort and support and inspiration. So yeah, being visible and present rather than trying to hide and <laughs> no one knows where you are. Secondly, uh, just call for a, a various strategy meetings uh, of your stakeholders and your best advisors. If you can get their buy-in uh, and their, their uh, advice, uh, then if things start to continue to go bad, they won't turn against you because they were part of things right from the beginning. Number th three, uh, always keep the big picture in view. Um, be careful not to get overwhelmed with emotion or discouragement, but um, keep the, the big picture. And that includes uh, our faith and the spiritual perspective that God is with us and will make a way for us where there seems to be no way, even when you can't uh, easily see how something will play out. Number four of six steps for leaders uh, on handling crisis is to give hope to your people. We saw a good amount of this in the COVID uh, crisis where leaders uh, stood up and, and helped people to realize we'll, we'll make it through this. No storm is permanent and we can get through this. Um, Napoleon Bonaparte has this famous quotation that I like. It says, a leader is a dealer in hope. As a leader, you're constantly uh, trying to inspire and, and build up the, the strength in people through giving them hope. Number five, when you're in a crisis, just tackle uh, things one step at a time. Uh, with a crisis, it's very hard to know how it's going to play out, but uh, you don't have to have a game plan for the entire thing. You just have to look at what is needed right now, and you 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 handle that as it's uh, emerging. Lastly, never take a major decision when you're really feeling emotionally down. Um, 
sometimes leaders, uh, you know, they, they bear an extra load of stress and responsibility. But if you start taking uh, decisions when you're at a low point, uh, you can make some uh, bad decisions. So just stay strong as you, um, as you face uh, decisions, make sure you're, you're making them from a healthy uh, frame of mind. So these are the six, uh, be visible and present, call for various meetings, number three, keep the big picture in view, number four, evoke people, number five, pass things one step at a time, number six, never take a major decision when you're really feeling down. Okay, as I conclude, um, on a personal level, I gave this talk a lot in 2020 just because it was a time when people were really uh, losing their minds and and panicking during the, 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 the time when the uh, COVID situation was uh, blowing up. But uh, yeah, it's, it, this, this can be uh, applied to all storms of life, uh, not just the COVID situation, but um, it has seven uh, points to it. It's more for you as a, as, as a person. Uh, the first one is uh, just to realize that storms are natural periodic occurrences that will keep coming throughout your life. I have a, a mentor who's like 15, 20 years older than me, and I was so surprised to hear him one time saying uh, that uh, the storms of life keep coming. We, we think when we're young, that we'll reach a point where there'll be no more storms. But uh, you know, to hear someone who's much older than you saying the storms of life just keep coming, it, but what this does, it, it just makes you uh, realize the importance of investing and being ready and not being caught by surprise. Um, investing in relationships and savings, in your health and in your spiritual reserve so that you're ready when the storm hits. And, uh, you know, I, one of my favorite uh, quotations of Jesus is this one that says, uh, in this world, you will have tribulation. It's just... It's just part of the equation. Um, the world is set up like a school for training souls. So you can't have a school where there's no tests and there's no exams. So uh, those storms are like tests that are right, uh, built right into the system. So just take them, uh, take it for granted, take it as a given that the, the storms of life keep coming and just don't get shocked and depressed when they happen. Don't start saying, why me? Because everybody, uh, has to go through them. Number two, uh, when a storm hits, uh, take it as a sign to move higher spiritually. Um, on the screen is a picture of an eagle. Uh, they, the eagle is the only bird that when a storm is coming, it goes higher um, it, to get up the clouds. All the other small birds are going down to take cover and fear, but it goes above the clouds and it knows that it's, it's up. The sun is always shining. And, uh, the storm can't touch it. So be like an eagle, go higher during uh, a storm. Number three um, says, uh, we may be in the same storm, realize that we're not all in the same boat. Uh, this COVID situation has affected people differently. Some people have made money, big amount of money. Uh, the list of billionaires in the world has actually grown during the time of COVID, but for many people, it's been a time of isolation, uh, economic hardship, but just realize uh, that the storm can affect others differently than you and be sensitive and compassionate to those around you. Number five, uh, four point of handling storms of life says, um, you have the responsibility to keep yourself strong. You have to do the, the things that keep your health and your spiritual life strong. I like this quotation that says, all the water from all the oceans cannot sink a boat unless it begins to get too much inside of it. Those of us who have been around the lakes here in Africa, you can see these fishermen on these wooden canoes. They, they have a little bowl and they keep scooping the water out from their canoe. Uh, just a, every few minutes they stop, they scoop some water out. And, you can do that on an emotional and spiritual level if you constantly 
have ways to recharge your batteries and to get out negativity and to make sure that uh, the, the water doesn't build up too much inside of your little boat. Okay, number five, uh, we're going to up to seven and then I'll stop. Number five says, as leaders, we also have the responsibility to keep those around us strong. Um, I gave you this quotation earlier of Napoleon that good leaders are dealers in hope. And as a leader, remember that everything you do or say or even think has an effect around the people around you. And uh, you, you as a, a leader have to be the one that rallies people and helps them uh, to gain uh, strength. Number six, storms shift things. They create change. But sometimes in change, there's an opportunity to improve. I mean, what we're doing right now via Zoom, uh, this has been a result of the COVID crisis. And you know, in my organization, we work in seven countries. Uh, and Zoom has been a, a blessing in a way. It's, we are actually connecting better now than we were before. So there are opportunities that come uh, in a storm. And the Chinese word for crisis, uh, you might have seen this before, it has two letters. The Chinese have these funny characters. So when they write the word crisis, uh, the first character signifies a time of danger. And the second uh, character in the word crisis is a time of opportunity. So often during times of uh, crisis, there are opportunities that can come up. Charles Darwin, in his famous book, The Origin of Species, which talks about natural selection and evolution, says uh, it's not the most intellectual of the species that survives. It's not the strongest species that survive, but the species that survive are the ones that are able to best adapt and adjust to changing environments. So this is uh, for us. As individuals, uh, those who will survive in a crisis are those who can adapt and adjust. Finally, how to come out of a uh, storm. I got this one from a Walt Disney movie that came just before the COVID uh, crisis hit. Um, and I don't watch much movies, uh, certainly not children's movies, but people told me this one had some good themes to it. It's a story of uh, a prince who go on a journey to correct um, a, a wrong that her grandfather had done to their kingdom that had kind of brought a curse on the kingdom. And she didn't really know what the journey was leading and what to do, but she was told one thing, told every juncture, every decision point, just do the right thing, the next right thing that you're capable of doing. And if you think of that, uh, yeah, it, it's like faith. It's, Take the next step, as Martin Luther Jr., uh, King Jr. said, even when you can't see the whole state staircase, just take the step that's ahead of you right now. Do what you can do. And you think that, that's a character. The character is doing the you know is right. Even, uh, at that very moment, even when you can't see the whole journey. And when you do the next right thing, it's like you put your life into a lament. God's will, and he continues to guide you through the crisis. So that's my talk for this morning uh, in this section. Uh, storms are natural occurrences. That's point number one, just expect them. Point number two, move higher during uh, a storm. Point number three, recognize you can be in the same storm, but people are in different boats. Point number four, you have the responsibility to keep yourself strong. Number five, as leaders, you have to take responsibility to keep those around us strong. Number six, storms storm shift things around. They disrupt, they create change. But in the change, look for opportunity and look for things that you can do differently. And lastly, to come out of a storm, uh, just keep focusing on doing the next right thing. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take a step that is ahead of you right now. So that's my talk. Uh, if you'd like it, just send me an email, timcroyder at gmail. Good to be with all you guys. And uh, yeah, over to you, MC Neb. 
Thank you so much, Uncle Tim. Thank you for that powerful presentation. And of course, you can go right ahead and tell us what you're getting so far in the chat box. And once again, we'll do our very best to get back to you. All right. And just in case you're joining in, I believe we have this resource for you just in case you came in late. Karibu, you are not late. We are just getting started and we hope to have a great time together. Now, I want to introduce our next speaker. Yes, I'm please. really excited about, you know, this virtual thing uh -huh. whereby you get to see. Let me, very quickly, very quickly, let me see, let me see. We have people online. Uh, let me let me give a, a few shout outs there. Uh, we have Jacqueline. I see Jacqueline over there. I see Daniel. I see you. I see you, Arafat. Hey, good stuff, you guys. So talk to us. Uh, we'll come back. We have uh, prizes just for you to win. We have questions that yes. you answer. And, you know, you can walk away with great merchandise. And also, we have some goodies for you. Now, on to our next speaker. Uh, she's called Phyllis Wakiaga. Uh -huh. uh, she's a Kenyan lawyer uh -huh. uh, and a corporate executive. She has served as the chief executive officer of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers since 2015. Wow. She has uh, experience working on e EAC, that is East African Community, Comesa, and other trade blocks, and in the KQ, that is Kenya Airways. Mm -hmm. She is passionate about establishing a culture of performance and continuous improvement to increase customer satisfaction, increase efficiency, drive growth, and enhance profitability. Wow, Business Daily, top 40 under 40 business in 2016. Amazing. Top 10 Kenyan communicators in 2017. BBC Power, Women Africa, 2016. Wow. Most influential people of African descent in 2019. Amazing. <laughs> Phyllis Wakiaga is married, a mother of four children. She is of the Seventh Day Adventist faith. And she teaches Bible study and music classes to children at her church. What a privilege that we have today just to hear from her. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a profile. What a profile. <laughs> yeah. So if you can hear us, Phyllis, can you hear us? Can you get to hear us? You can take it away. Morning. I can morning. You? And good morning. You? And Okay, that's, that's fine. So good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today for the Africa Youth Run, Leadership Run, Forum. Run. Can you hear me? It was, uh, it was really, really going down. I think we need someone because I can hear a conversation in the background. But yes, it's a great honor to join you this morning, uh, though virtually, but I think uh, that is the norm uh, in this day and age. So allow me to start by sharing something the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, once said. He said, as the young leaders of tomorrow, you have the passion, the energy, and commitment to make a difference. What I'd really like to do is to give you a global vision. Go beyond your country, go beyond your national boundaries. So today's conversation reflects on the former UN Secretary General's statement as we look at reshaping Africa's leadership through character and more so from young leaders and a youth perspective. So allow me to take the opportunity first to recognize all of you who have been able to join this morning, our esteemed student leaders, the students who have joined us, the young professionals, and all the distinguished guests. So I'm the CEO of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. So I'll just say a little bit about who we are. We are the representative body of uh, industry in Kenya. And uh, we have existed for the last 62 years. And our work has been to advocate for a competitive environment for doing business and ensuring that we are creating better industries that we are driving our industries to think about the environment, sustainability, governance, and really just building a sustainable local industry in the country. Our end game is to create jobs, improve livelihoods for the people of Africa. And uh, a lot of our members don't just do business in Africa, but uh, have investments and carry out trade uh, around the continent, not just in Kenya. So as an association, we're also very passionate about the youth. As you can tell, I'm, I'm a little bit youthful. Okay, I used to be young, but I'm probably growing older. But yes, I've, I've uh, 
continue to support and drive the agenda uh, of the youth uh, and how we can thrive on the vibrancy, the creativity, and the difference that the youth bring on the table, not just for the country, but the continent. And also how we can continue to um, position and give you the exposure you need to run the future um, multinationals and, uh, and, and, and businesses that will serve the continent and the world. So for today's conversation, I was specifically tasked to share some insights on what is wrong with Africa. And I however wish to take a different approach to this uh, conversation. From where I sit, Africa is endowed with vast opportunities. We have mineral resources, including some of the world's largest reserve fossil fuels. We have metallic ores. We have precious metals. We also have great diversity of biological resources, including our forests and our large wildlife as a, as, as a continent. And to add to this, uh, we have diverse features in the continent, all the way from the Rift Valley ranges and mountains to our deserts, not forgetting our population that also has a very diverse culture. But despite these features, we are yet to fully exploit the opportunities that are presented to us by God, uh, who has given us all these opportunities. And we can attribute some of this to corruption, to economic debt, to poor governance, unemployment, food insecurity, the slow development rate in the continent amongst others. So all those are contributors to the inability of Africa to fully utilize the resources and opportunities that we have. So in corruption and poor governance, corruption is definitely one of the most serious constraints to development. What it does is that it limits the growth of a country and diminishes the productivity. And it also impacts on a country's ability to offer critical services to its citizens. It increases the cost of doing business. And for us in the industry or business community, that's a concern because the ability to then create jobs and expand opportunities is limited. So what we need is we really need to Need this at the bad. We need good governance uh, that is really hinged on proper laws and processes. We also need proper structures that promote accountability. And for accountability, I think that one means we elect our elected officials and we have a role to hold them accountable. We also need rule of law within our countries where we are governed by all the land. We need inclusiveness, transparency, empowerment, and broad-based pressure. The UN Global Compact, which is the largest corporate sustainability network, I chair the network in Kenya. And what we are trying to do is to say that as businesses, we will not engage in any form of bribery. And we've brought like-minded businesses together to instill this within their processes, within their supply chains, so that we also play our part in minimizing corruption because there are two sides to it. We want to strengthen the legal side, the policies, but we also want to change behavior and the messaging around how business approaches corruption and ensures that there is no bribery also from our side. The other issue I'll speak to is economic debt. Um, Governments need resources to provide social services to citizens, including education, health, sanitation, and transport services. While taxes provide the main source of revenue, there are alternatives such as domestic and foreign debt. Um, however, what is happening is increasing public debt is posing a risk to the stability of many African economies. And this is especially so if a country does not have sufficient revenue to pay interest payments within the stipulated timelines without straining its citizens. And to address this, there is need for governments in Africa to put in place public finance management systems that prioritize the efficient management of government revenue and expenditure so that we can spur sustainable economies without burdening citizens. And to relook at the whole spectrum around debt and why we borrow 
and what we utilize our borrowing for. Is it the most efficient uh, investment that will bring the highest returns to our citizens and that we are able to pay? So that's another area that we need to look at and fix if we are going to do economies. Then I'll go to the challenge of unemployment. We have the high rates of unemployment in the continent and we play a huge role as, as industry in creation of these opportunities and jobs. And when governments don't provide that conducive environment for businesses to thrive, it becomes difficult to create these opportunities and the ability then to create jobs is diminished. And one of the main things then is for the creation of this environment where the cost of doing business, the ease of doing business is good. That way it also enables the youth and the young people who are creative, who are innovative, who are entrepreneurs and have that talent given to them by God to go into the market and set up businesses, to be able to create jobs for themselves and others. So we continue to say that until we address the issues of competitiveness and bring down the cost of doing business in Africa and uh, at things like transport and logistics, the cost of power, and many other items that increase the cost, we will not be able to create adequate jobs or also encourage uh, young people to get into entrepreneurship. So that's an area that continues to be also a conversation at our level as the Association of Manufacturers to improve the role of business in creating jobs. You can't speak about um, the continent without speaking about agriculture and food insecurity. Agriculture is a primary economic activity for most of the continent, but food insecurity continues to affect many parts of Africa. Uh, drought is one of the factors that impacts on agricultural produce, and it has a direct effect on what households can depend on and also reduces uh, raw materials needed by agro-processing industries. And a number of issues apart from the drought, we have the post-harvest losses due to storage systems, also the widening yield gap due to the low input, such as the seed quality, um, the technology that we utilize for agriculture amongst others. So there's need for us to invest in water storage facilities um, and also move from rain-fed agriculture and put in place measures to minimize the post-harvest losses in the country. And then looking at how we diversify also uh, within the agricultural sector is critical. So I've talked about uh, sort of contextualize some of the issues uh, we see as key issues uh, from where we sit. And now I want to address the issue of the space for the youth. Um, I know amongst us, we are having a conversation with young people who are the leaders of today. Uh, I don't believe in being leaders of tomorrow. Um, I became, a, at least in the business community, I started, got into managerial roles very young. So we are the leaders of today. Um, and the above issues require the development of forward-looking policies and strategies. And central to this is the participation of the youth. Um, in, uh, at least in our country, I'll start, I'll just speak to Kenya we have public participation entrenched in our constitution. So the ability of members of the public to be required or to require the government to involve them in decision-making at national level, at sub-national level. So that is a platform created for all of us to participate. But how many of us get involved at our sub-national meetings when they're looking at the budgets, when they're looking at documents, when laws are published and we need to give our input. So there is a room for participation of the youth uh, in, in, in all of this. Um, the challenge of course is that in a number of cases, the youth are not adequately enabled to participate in the country's social, economic and political development. Um, there are many reasons for this. Some of them would be an unemployment or underemployment some of them could be the lack of the, of, 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 of the skills. Uh, if you're reviewing, say, legislation, the, the, the skills it would take to review, put together memoranda, and, and, and approach the necessary government bodies. And also the lack of necessary institutional support to bring the great ideas 
of the youth to fruition. So those challenges exist, but I think platforms like this can go a long way in coming up with proposals on how these challenges can be addressed as the business community or industry or government with this well-written or thought out um, proposals from the youth, or how we can support in engagement, it would be possible then to really capitalize on the strength that comes from the ideas that would come from the youth. So engaging young people will continue to enrich institutions and processes and the current dynamic global situation emphasizes this. If we take just one critical aspect of empowering youth such as skills development, we not only engage them in creating sustainable solutions for themselves,